Hello and welcome. I'm Tracy Polowich, host of the Excellence Connection podcast, where we connect our listeners with subject matter experts and knowledge and resources uh, to help achieve outstanding results and improve organizational performance. My guest today is Dan Corbett. He has extensive experience in organizational change and human capital strategies. Welcome to the show, Dan. Hi, Tracy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for being here. Today, we're going to discuss trust in leadership. And um, Dan, please, can you give us a brief introduction of yourself and tell us a little bit about your background? Hey, thanks very much. Uh, when somebody says you have extensive experience, it means you've been around for a long time. And uh, I have been around for a long time, actually. Um, so quickly, uh, my early career, uh, when I was sort of just out of university, I, I got really lucky. I had a ter terrific opportunity come my way to go to work in a chemical manufacturing plant. And my background was in business. And I was my specialty was labor relations. But you know, I couldn't do much just by the academic institute. So I, I decided to get my hands r right on it. And uh, I spent seven years, Tracy, my first real experience was as the HR manager in a chemical plant that had a lot of issues. I had a lot of health issues, safety issues, production issues, uh, you name it. And uh, I was right in the middle of it. And you know what? I loved it. I really liked it. And I said, man, this is good. And one of the things that happened, um, just to, it was fortuitous, was that I was invited to uh, Houston, where, where the corporate office was, to take part in a human resource conference. And in that human resource conference, there was a group of people came from the organization, and they were called Quality, quality and Productivity. And they talked about what they were doing, and I got really excited by that. And that was my first introduction to Quality and Productivity when I was very young, and we brought that group to the plant and uh, spent a fair bit of time looking at how we go about improvement. But then what I learned there uh, at that plant, uh, the lessons learned followed me throughout my career. Uh, I learned about trust. I learned about people. I learned about inspiration. I learned about despair. I mean, it was a whole set of issues that you could look at with respect to the whole uh, human dynamic and how they humans interact with organizations. So then from there, I got to be promoted into Toronto. Uh, in fact, became a VP for the organization, heading up human resources and quality for uh, the North American operation. It was about nine or 10 different plant locations. But what I learned back in that original plant carried with me then as well. And so even though I was moving up, you know, into the ladder, you know, I recognized that if I lose touch with the front line, if I lose touch with the people who are out there doing the work, then I'm losing touch with respect to why that company is there. So I always made it a point in, in my sort of senior type career to be out of the corporate office and visiting the plants. And one of the things that happened when I was doing that was uh, the whole, you mentioned about trust. You know, why would people trust me, right? And so it was a whole interesting set of dynamics that took place as, as I spent time in the plants, walking around and then leaving after a couple of days, but they knew I was coming back. So, so that, that was an interesting perspective. But you know, careers uh, are never straight lines. I got to a point, quite frankly, you know, with the private sector, I said, um, I want to do something different with my life, quite honestly. Um, and I applied just on a chance and I think it was more serendipitous than anything else to be the uh, president and CEO of a post-secondary college in Ontario, St. Lawrence College. And I got the job. And one of the reasons I got the job <laughs> was the chair of the board and chair of the selection committee was a business person who had his own business in the community and was working on ISO 14,000 registration for his business. And in the, in the meeting, he said to me, how would you put quality in education? And I started to talk with him about it. And lo and behold, that's not the only reason, but I got the job. And what happened then was about three or four years in to that position, uh, 
St. Lawrence College became the first uh, post-secondary college in North America to be ISO registered. And it wasn't me, but it was a team. It was a team of people who put it together and had faith in what they wanted to do. And so then that led me into another turn in my career where, um, you know, it was the so-called 15 minutes of fame, you know, the Andy Warhol thing, because you mm -hmm. go to college, you register, da, 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 everybody wants to hear from you. So we sent a team of folks around Canada and, you know, going off and giving in, uh, sessions and seminars. But uh, I had a recruiter call me and wanting to know if I'd be interested in heading up what was then called the National Quality Institute. And I said, well, yeah, I want to do that. And so I spent about nine years uh, as president and CEO uh, for the NQI. And that's the point in time in which the Institute was moving away from federal government support. We had to become a nonprofit organization and we had to survive. But uh, more importantly, we had uh, the excellence criteria, the Canada Awards for Excellence and the business excellence framework that we started to promote across the country. And then that became the equivalent of, you know, the Baldrige in the United States and the EFQM in Europe. So, so it's a long story, uh, which I tried to shorten for you, but, you know, um, I, I became a believer that the lessons you learn when you're young can be carried forward and the circumstances may be different, but if they're, if they're sort of true to, to your belief, uh, then you can apply them to a lot of different situations. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that background and everything um, that you've done. You know, you cite evidence that organizations and any organization really um, can achieve positive results through the implementation and focus on excellent systems and uh, um, building that trust throughout the organization and through employee engagement. I know you've also acknowledged that um, there's a tremendous pressure on organizations to uh, deliver results and that that can maybe lead to organizational fatigue. And I think we're seeing some of that uh, since the pandemic. Sure. And, yeah. you know, people yeah. are, um, we're hearing that there's even, um, something coined the great resignation where uh, there's a phenomenon that employees are leaving in record numbers from their jobs because of the fatigue through the through the pandemic what is your advice for business leaders who say that they just don't have time they're so busy just coping with their day-to-day -day and running their business they don't have the time to focus on implementing an excellence model or investing time in building trust with their employees? Well, uh, look, I mean, I certainly understand what the last couple of years have been like. I mean, uh, when you said fatigue, I think there's fatigue all across the country, fatigue from the pandemic, fatigue from how we've had to adjust our lives and what we've had to do. And I, you know, feel my, uh, just my heart goes out to all these small businesses across the country that have had to try to find a way to survive the last couple of years. And so, you know, some of them have not, but I think most have. And um, I don't want to be Pollyannish about this, but I'm a believer in from adversity comes opportunity. I've seen that in my own life, you know, that adversity comes opportunity. So, so I, I think, first of all, the excellence models that we have in Canada uh, and the OEF framework as well, Ballridge, EFQM in Europe, all of these organizations that have gone down that journey have become open books. So when you go and you can say, you know, they, they clearly demonstrated improvements in results and improvements in customer satisfaction and improvements in employee satisfaction and social responsibility all across the board, the measures are there. I mean, some people might argue with it, but you go out, they're open books. You can go and read it, you know, when you can see what each organization has done. So it's there, but they also tell you that it took them three years, four years, five, you know, to move to where, to where they were. So I think with respect to small business, um, I think what you look at is, is this, and here's my advice. Um, I think good, good managers know the cost of rework. Yeah. All right. Um, they don't want to have to go back and do something all over again. Uh, like there's a whole industry of re rework out there, right? You know, if you look at it, Six Sigma, Lean, 
Uh, all of these are designed so organizations don't have to get into rework. So I think uh, a, a business owner, even though he or she is looking to figure out how to survive, they should know what their strengths are, number one. Uh, that an organization like the Organizational Excellence Specialist, um, while you have a, a large framework of criteria to look at, I think how you chunk it up and look at it gives, gives a small business the opportunity to start doing things in a very practical way. So, uh, so it becomes like a roadmap. Uh, you know, you want to get to, let's say you want to get to Vancouver. I'm in Kingston. You want to get to Vancouver. So you got to figure out how to get to, you know, Toronto. And, and I think uh, chunking things up in smaller measurable packages and giving uh, the small business community, especially tools that they can work with, easily work with, whereby they don't need to start incurring a lot of extra overhead is the way to go. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunity out there in, you know, people like yourself and others who work with a organizational excellence specialist around have go, go in and find ways. But let me tell you, I think uh, the fundamental piece that I see, uh, and that's, that's the issue. And I, I see it here in Kingston with small business that have survived, that they work closely with their employees, that they were truthful with them. They developed uh, a relationship of trust, you know? And I've heard some people say, I don't wanna lay my people off. I wanna try to find ways to keep them employed, All right? So when you start having that, you know, relationship take place, then I think all kinds of things are possible. Uh, employees will start to rise to the occasion. Uh, so you don't have to look at, at this the last two years as a wasteland. I think there's some tremendous lessons to be learned from everything that's gone on. If you go in and look at, and I've seen that as well. I know what you've said about the great resignation, but there's also stories out there of organizations that have been tremendously innovative and small business owners and leaders who have worked closely with their employees and closely in their community to try to find ways to survive. Now, I can't give you a standard package and say, here it is, I, but I think I think the, the big issue to me is, is uh, looking at it from a, a, a perspective, what can we get in the next you know, 90 days as opposed to three to five years out from an excellence framework. But if a small business wants to go down that route, then looking at the excellence criteria becomes a great pathway for it because then you're not sort of willy nilly choosing the latest kind of gizmo that's come along that's gonna survive and make you survive. I think you start to look at things then how, how can this fit into the pathways of an excellence criteria? I don't know if that answered your question, but it just, that's-, that's Yeah, just to on, you know? dive a bit deeper into that. So how, how exactly does investing time in, you know, implementing an excellence model differ from that never ending um, series of new programs and the latest, um, the latest trends about how how organizations can quickly um, gain more productivity and those quick solutions that are claimed to them. Well, I, th I think in, you can have some quick solutions within the excellence criteria, and that's what you need to look at. You know, if if uh, if I'm going to be you know taking a tool to work with or some technique. How does that fit within the criteria, okay? And an organization that's looking at the excellence criteria will say, okay, with respect to um, people engagement, I'll take one of those, okay? So what, what are the tools that I can work with around the people engagement piece? What are some of the tools I can work with around customer uh, engagement, customer satisfaction? So instead of doing something that's 180 degrees different from what the criteria is, you can take a specific measure or a specific uh, uh, web web tool or something and how to fit it into the criteria so it makes sense. In other words, you have a pathways and you don't want to start taking all kinds of detours. And that's what that's what the, 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 the tendency might be sometimes to grab onto something that really is a detour that it'll give you sort of, a, you know, a sugar high, you know, where you get yeah. that instant hit but then you need another head of sugar, you know, a little bit later. Whereas the criteria excellence frameworks to me start to say, look, I can take this tool and fit it in here because it makes perfectly perfect sense because it'll lead me to here. Okay. That's, that's what I think is the fundamental difference. Right. So basically 
really keeping a focus on what your end goals are and applying the tools that are going to have the best effect on the areas that need the most improvement first. That kind yeah, of I, 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 that's, that's a great way of summarizing. I mean, I think um, the, the issue is a line of sight, you know, too. Okay. I mean, that's a nice sort of turn of phrase, but what am I trying to achieve here? Okay. And how can the various pieces that I'm wanting to get, whether from the OES consulting group or somebody else, how does that fit into taking me to where I really want to be? Right. And that's what the criteria I think does. Good. Um, so you noted um, with your experience in manufacturing and you invited that quality and, and productivity group to work with your team and try to make some um, look at some of the improvements in process and and uh, address some of the challenges that that organization was having. Uh, you found that a lot of the change was needed in the management level and not necessarily with the operational employees. What are some of those changes that you, you believe were needed at that management level? Well, um, the, 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 there's two or three things I'll, I'll just talk with you about for a second. I mean, <clears throat> when you're going to bring change into an organization, whatever it is, uh, I'll, the quote I think is a Gandhi quote, you have to be the change you want to be, mm -hmm. right? And so if you're going to do something like, let's say you're going to take the excellence framework criteria into your organization, uh, then there are certain, you know, behaviors, there are certain uh, attributes that you look at from a management perspective to say, you know, can I do, are we doing this or not? You know, okay, so before you start off in the change process, you have to look internally within yourself as a management group to say, is this consistent with what we're saying, okay? So you, you were talking earlier about trust and trust to me is a two-way street. So uh, if a management group is bringing in a change process and it, even if it is the excellence criteria, the organization will look at the management group to say, are they practicing what they say? Yeah. Now they might not say it that way, but I can tell you, and many times I mentioned, you know, when I would go around to various plants and I would go to the front line. Uh, I can tell you now, almost, almost inevitably, I got the truth. I got the truth from the front line. They would tell me what they're thinking about the people in the office above, right? So, but the the people in the office sometimes weren't thinking the same way, right? So, uh, so you have to. I think you've got to look at it from what am i being consistent okay am i speaking the language that's consistent with the change i'm talking about so if you're if you're saying we want to have a more um, engaging organization that we want to be inclusive then first of all i'd say is the management group behaving in an in an inclusive way are they open or not you know because that's very apparent, you know, and sometimes, you know, you, you see it, you know, you wander around the organization and if you don't see it yourself, then sometimes you, you start doing something and you think you've got it right. Whereas in fact, the organization starts rebelling against you because you're saying, but this is, this is the way I think I should do it. But no, it's not. I mean, you have to sort of fundamentally sit back and say, are we, are we emulating what it is we're saying we're going to do? Okay. Right. Now that's simple, but it's also very complex. Simple because, okay, uh, I've, got to, I've got to behave in the way that I'm saying I want the change process to be. The complexity of it is you're dealing with the organization culture, you're de dealing with human behavior, you're dealing with uh, you know, uh, enormous issues in, the, in, a, in, a, in an employee location, that all oftentimes is not fully known. So, so you had to think about that change process with respect to how am I going to implement and what am I going to do? And oftentimes I find it's not that there's nothing wrong, Tracy, with the change itself, but it's in the implementation of that change where things go wrong. You know? Right, so this brings us to sort of the alignment concept and getting everybody aligned in that same direction and focusing all the resources on the outcomes that you're looking for. Where, um, 
what are some examples of how an organization can can achieve that alignment? Well, uh, I think there's two or three things. Um, look, can I just when you talk about alignment, uh, and I, I'm a firm believer in alignment, by the way, that one of the issues that I used to find when we'd go around uh, doing organizational assessments for the Excellence Canada Awards of Excellence, almost inevitably the lowest rating in terms of scoring was on strategic plan. Now, it's not that there wasn't a good strategic plan. Like when you go into the boardroom, and I used to go into the boardrooms, they would tell me how wonderful the strategic plan is. They would show me in color and brochures and everything that they had. There's no question the organization had done an awful lot of work around strategic plan, right? Yes. But when we would go into the organization levels to the next level down, you know, I would ask people about the strategic plan. Since let's say at the first line management level, right? And they would say, well, I, uh, I you know, I heard something about that a month ago. Um, you know, he came, somebody came and talked to us about it, you know? Oh, and there's a couple of things on the wall about it as well, right? And then when you go to the front line, where I inevitably used to go, um, almost nobody knew what the strategic plan was, but you, if they could maybe articulate a couple of goals or something. So to me, the thing that around the, the getting line of sight or alignment is, is how well the senior level of the organization has moved the messaging through consistently to each and every level. And there's simple things that you can do, you know. Uh, when I was with um, on the board here, the Family and Children's Services Agency, which I just left last year, uh, one of the things we did at the board level was said, look, there's nothing coming on our board agenda unless we can directly connect it to the strategic plan. So every issue that was coming forward to the board, we were able to look at it as board community volunteers and look at it and say, yeah, that's right. That fits this piece right here. And that's what this agency did as well at the next level. I could, I remember walking around as the board chair and people knew, you know, you can ask them, they might not be able to articulate it the same way the executive director did, but they understood what it was. They understood there were two or three or four goals that they were trying to do. They understood how they fit into that as well, you know, how their job connected to what the organization was doing. So it's not a complicated piece, but it really means that the uh, senior management level um, need to figure out the communication strategy. It's got to be clear. It's got to be consistent and it has to be repeated and repeated and repeated and repeated because the organization sometimes, you know, the lower you go, it's not mired in strategy. They're mired in, you know, I got to get this shipment out, yeah, I got to get this, you know, day to day stuff. But they need to understand that their day-to-day -day stuff is connected to where the organization wants to go. So how can you do that? How can you connect them even more strongly to that strategic, how they how they link to that strategy? Are there any well, specific things? Yeah, I mean, look, um, I, uh, you know, one of the things I did was I was doing some consulting work when I left the National Quality Institute, and uh, I did spend some time around this, but how do you build alignment? And so the alignment process, I would go in as a consultant, quite frankly, is what I did. But I can remember one organization, I spent uh, a day in a room with about 250 people, where uh, throughout the day, there were tables being discussed. But what they were talking about was a specific issue. Now, they weren't talking about the grand strategic plan, but the issue was in the strategic plan that we brought down and put into the language that people, you know, at the front line of the organization knew that this is something I could work with. OK, and so you had to simplify it. That's the first thing. The st strategic plans can be very complicated. They shouldn't be. So you simplify it. That's number one thing. The second part of it was uh, I've seen organizations when they're building a strategic plan, going through an awful lot of engagement up front. There's a tendency to bring in the consultants. I, I'm not against that. I mean, I think consultants have a purpose. Okay, so you can breathe easy, Tracy. Okay, but <laughs> but uh, 
in the end, it, it's when, when you have a strategic plan, you've got to be able to say, how can I distill this down as the senior person so that I can go and sit in a room of uh, frontline representatives, customer representatives, and talk with them in the language I understand that connects to what they are doing day to day to the larger goal of the organization. So I, I've always believed that the, the role of the uh, senior person, the CEO, or the whatever they call themselves now, you know, the names are changing, uh, has got to be, you know, the chief communications officer as well. He or she needs to understand, they need to spend time, and it's not with the level reporting to them, it's the level two, three, down into the organization. So, so that's one way of doing it. I think um, the other way that I would seriously consider, and I saw this happen in a number of organizations, is the performance management plan. I mentioned earlier to you um, <clears throat> that the board I was on said, unless we can connect this to the strategic plan, it's not on our board agenda. Except, by the way, they had to do governance issues, you know, by law, okay? So if you look at your performance management plan, the individual plan, how does that, what goes on there, connect to the strategic plan? Now, it, you know, you're not going to say to the uh, customer service representative is driving deliveries around Calgary or something. You've got to have the strategic plan, but you can connect his or her performance to what's going on to the larger good. I think you can, but you have to be able to simplify it, communicate it, and, and make it relevant to what uh, employees are doing on the front line. They need to see. And the other thing is celebrate. You know, one of the best organizations I can remember um, really used celebration a lot. And, and this was um, the Delta Hotel group. I can remember going to maybe half a dozen more different meetings I was involved with uh, when I was with the uh, Canada, um, Canada Awards for Excellence, that they would go and they would have meetings of their employees at different locations, Calgary, Vancouver, I was there. They'd bring them all together and they'd celebrate what they'd achieved. And so the employee, you know, the person who's looking after the room or the person who's looking at the front desk and what have you, was given the opportunity to come together with his and her colleagues to celebrate what the business was able to accomplish. So all of a sudden you've elevated the so-called, I won't say mundane, but the daily routine of what somebody was doing to the larger good. That probably really helps with building trust as well and allowing the employees to feel comfortable with sharing and, and you know, coming up with ideas and so on. If you're, if you're celebrating those that are successful, that, that can probably really help with that trust, trust building as well. Absolutely. It, it does build trust, you know, I mean, because people see this, uh, a trust is a two-way street, right? I mean, it takes a long time to build and you can lose it in an instant, right? But when you do things like you were just talking about, when you celebrate achievement, then people begin to see that, you know, this is not about them. This is about, um, not even, it's about we, okay? We are all in this together, okay? And so uh, so people begin to say, yeah, I can, I can support what's taking place. I can trust what's going on because I know uh, when things are going well, um, you know, I'll know that, but they also should know when things aren't going well, right? <laughs> so, so there's that balance that always has to be maintained. And unfortunately, I think in the world we're in, so many pressures that leaders and managers have, oftentimes they're just simply not taking time anymore to celebrate, you know? Right. So um, what about appreciative inquiry? Where does that come into play with all of this? Well, um, I think it fits excellently, by the way. With, <laughs> with, no, it fits with excellence criteria. Um, so there's a whole pro process and set of principles around appreciative inquiry. But let me break it down the simplest way. It's a strengths-based process. So, in fact, I just did a, a session here this weekend. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing volunteer work now, by the way, in the community. So I was working with a, a local group here um, that's trying to form a new theater group. And uh, so I knew the person who was trying to organize it. And I said, fine, I'll do, I'll do the workshop for you. 
So we used, uh, we used the workshop from a strengths perspective. And so instead of going in and doing a, a, the simple approach that most organizations will do, which is the SWAT, you know, strengths, weaknesses, op opportunities, and threats. I mean, you've probably done, I've done it, right? Uh, what happens? Where, where do you spend most of your time when you do that? Working, looking at what's wrong. That's right. And, and you become really, really good at understanding what's wrong, right? Whereas appreciative inquiry turns the thing 180 degrees and it says, let's soar. Strengths, opportunities, appreciation, and results. So I took this group through, uh, through that exercise of defining their strengths, understanding what you want to do, what's your aspiration. How are you going to put some actions and plans around that? And, and what, what are you going to be measures of success? And, and I just sent it back to them just in fact yesterday, I gave it to them. They didn't, I didn't go in and talk to them about appreciative inquiry, by the way. You know, I mean, you could spend a whole day and, you know, people will get fuzzy and blurry. And, but I did talk with them about the importance of strength, the importance of if you're going to build success, then you need to understand clearly what your strengths are. And the appreciative inquiry is a great process to understand strengths. So if you're doing that, then you can clearly work uh, that within the context of the excellence framework as well. Because what, what, what's the excellent criteria about? It's certainly looking all, you know, the elements all the way from leadership to social responsibility. But if, you, if an organization is going to get into continuous improvement, then you've got to build on strength. If you just focus on weakness, it won't take you there. So that's the, that's the, the different perspective that I like about a strengths-based approach. And I think there's ways to marry it. I'm, I haven't seen a lot of it, but I think there are ways of doing that, you know, so, yeah. Absolutely, I love that. And I love that, you know, the strengths-based, it applies to individuals, to teams, to the organization as a whole. Yes. And I think it also ties back into that whole trust issue if you're you know if you're emphasizing strengths and um you know what you can leverage on in the organization to build on you know that that naturally is going to build trust that you know if i do something wrong it's not the end of the world there's all of these strengths that are helping to buoy the organization and individuals up and and you know continue to improve and um you know achieve achieve good results absolutely uh, you, you know you said it i mean uh from what i've seen um and uh and actually i went away and took a program down at case western reserve university which is this whole appreciative inquiry method started um organizations that focus around their strengths do exactly what you just said that you know they build trust right because there's a whole circle the closed circle that goes you know around instead of the hierarchy they're trying to go around you know so the strengths reinforce strengths uh the opportunities start to come out and people say okay fine but if we believe these are our strengths then how do we turn that a bit to take advantage of the opportunity that's there you know the other the other piece i like about it and it's very consistent with excellence criteria is that it's very open you know the excellence criteria is open right if you're going into organizational assessments you go back and you share the assessment process and and uh, strengths-based work does the same thing as well sharing it back into the organization so going back to the earlier question you asked me how do you get a line of sight right all of a sudden you've got people who've participated and, and it's being turned back to them and saying, here it is. This is what you talked about. And here's what you can do. And here's how your aspirations can be realized. Okay. And, and the advantage of that then is say, okay, how do I do that? So to me, the marriage that takes place could be the excellence criteria that says, okay, here's, here's how you can do it. Here's how you can do it from the point of view of leadership. Here's what you can do from, you know, governance. And so you, you can do it that way, you know. Yeah, people love to be asked and involved, right? Uh, that's been my experience when you when you do these assessments and exercises with with an organization and everybody is involved in it and asked to provide their opinions and their feedback. They they're usually quite surprised that they're be asked, being asked and then 
you know, they're, they're more than willing to share. And really those are the people that have the knowledge <clears throat> of the frontline issues that can help solve some of those issues that the management doesn't even, you know, wouldn't be able to think about at that level because they're not, they're not working at that level. So, uh, so right, by the way, and I saw that happen when we were doing a lot of uh, organizational assessment work, you know, around the Canada Awards program. Uh, we'd be going in and talking with employees at the front line and they were at first reserved with maybe being polite in some organizations. Yeah. But, you know, they're saying, what, what do you, you, you want to know what I think? Yes, I want to know what you think. Um, but then... <clears throat> You know the value of that process would be the value of somebody like yourself as well that says i can carry that message back to the senior levels that says look um, your employees want to be engaged they're they're excited by this what do you what you know how, how do we wrap that around and that's where the criteria starts to make make sense you know i've i don't think i've ever been in an organization where people intentionally come to work to screw things up no they don't. And people want to come to work because, uh, you know, they want things to work, you know, they because when things go wrong, uh, it's it's interfering with their work. I mean, they've got to be taken off what they're doing. And, you know, so so I think, you know, going back to the earlier conversation of, the, you know, leadership and, and senior management groups, they have to recognize that their, their frontline staff want the organization to succeed every bit as much as they do. But yeah. how do you how do you bring it all together? You know how do you make that happen? And that's where I think uh, excellence criteria frameworks work because you can look at the big picture and then break it down and say this is this is what we can be doing here. You know? yeah. yeah. So kind of full circle now, bringing it back to that one question I asked at the beginning. Maybe we can just summarize this way you know, with a leader that feels like they don't have time to kind of take on something like an, an implementation of an excellence model and, and the, you know, eating the elephant, what are maybe some of the very few most important things that they can do to get started today on their journey to better, um, like to excellence? The, the thing that I've always uh, recommended uh, is two things. One, do an organizational assessment. Start somewhere. Um, so, for instance, in the organization that I used to work with, um, we used to go in and we'd work on a plant by plant basis. We, we could go in and look at a, a different plant. And then when we had a, a, a good practice in one plant, we could go and share that practice with the other plants, you know? So it, it wasn't turning the organization upside down, but it was really starting uh, the process, right? So if you try to go too big, you'll fail. So you have to look at this, and there's no easy answer, but you look at it organization to organization. So that, that's one thing, you know, looking at the criteria and saying, oh my God, it's too big, but break it down and say, okay, what, what, what's the biggest issue here? That's what an organizational assessment will do for you. Uh, it might be a cycle time issue. It may be a competence issue. It may be, you know, so you start working on the local relevant issues as opposed to trying to be the big piece. The second, the second thing uh, I think that uh, leaders have to recognize is that I mentioned earlier uh, to you the concept of rework. And that, you know, the old line that says, there's never enough time to do it right, but there's always enough time to rework, to do it again. Do it over. Do it over. So, so sometimes what you need to be doing is going into an organization and saying, how much rework is going on in our place? This is, I mean, I'm not saying here, we're not talking huge issues, but if you've got a, if you've got a plant or if you've got a, a manufacturing facility or a retail outlet, how often are we having to repeat things? How often are we having issues with our customer relations? How, you know, so you start to, to break it down, Tracy. And then in, instead of saying, oh, I'm going to adopt the excellence criteria and we're going to be at the top of the game in 12, 18 months, you can start to look at it and say, my God, if we stop this rework in this area, we could not only save money, we would improve morale. 
because employees don't like where you work. Okay. No. So you start to me, the, the important thing is, yes, you want to have the larger piece, but how do you break it down? Break it down into simple areas. And I think the organizational assessment is the place you start. Awesome. So we've covered a lot of ground and I, um, I uh, have one more question for you. And that is how, how do you remain in the growth zone? So in other words, what do you do to deepen your growth mindset? Well, um, I like to think that I'm still in the growth mode, honestly. Um, I try not to use the word retired, by the way. Um, you know, to me, I've changed. I've changed careers kind of thing. I, I haven't worked. Gotten, I haven't been working for a living for, for over 10 years now. Okay. But I've been working. Uh, and that's what I tell people. So how do I get into the growth mode? Well, first of all, um, I like to give back. So I've been volunteering. I've been volunteering in a number of community organizations. I um, got really involved with uh, the uh, Family and Children's Services Agency here in, in our community because they do tremendously important work, especially, you know, for youth and care and, and the issues within our community. So I became very involved there as the chair of the board. And I, I know I did bring some of my learning, what we've talked about, by the way, mm -hmm. to the executive director and others. Uh, but as a board chair, I was always cognizant of the fact that I'm the board chair. <laughs> it's up to you to figure out. You have to do it. So, so that was one thing. Uh, and then when I left the board last year, um, the group wanted to do um, what I think is really vitally important work, and that's how to build success in education for youth and care. So they put together a working party and asked me if I would facilitate it. So that's what I've been doing, uh, facilitating this working group of um, professionals from the agency and faculty from Queen's University and several youth and care to try to figure out ways in which uh, uh, this agency or even the province can increase the success rate in education for youth and care. Now, the connection to that, by the way, is, you know, St. Lawrence College, right? <laughs> Where it was. So, so I, I tried to do, I tried to do that, in, you know, in terms of my growth mode. Uh, but the other, the other piece that I've done is uh, I've gone back to my early beginnings and I was very involved when university years and stuff in the, in the music singing groups. So, so I, uh, about five or six years ago, I decided to pick up the guitar again and start playing and then start singing. And a couple of friends of ours, we've, we've done some, you know, charity fundraising things around, around the area. And once a week I go to now what's gone for bit, it's called a senior center, but I go to the senior center. And I just went there yesterday for two hours and there was a bunch of people in the room, all wearing masks, by the way, because we're still into a mask mandate, uh, but we were jamming. So, so the reason I'm telling you that is I, I, I think it's everybody's different, but I, I think you can't lose sense of the nature of inquiry. You got to have a curious mind. And uh, if you have a curious mind, then I think your growth is exponential, you know, exponential. It'll keep, it'll just keep going on. So ask me in five years. I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, so. Well, it sounds like all those organizations are very lucky to have your you sharing your wisdom and your talent and and I certainly am very thankful to you and grateful to you today for for being on the show and sharing some of the knowledge and experience that you've had and I think it's going to be very meaningful for our listeners. Yeah. So thank you so much, Dan. Well, and and thank you, Tracy. I really enjoyed the conversation. And you know what? I'm really thrilled. Uh, in terms of the sole issue of excellence and quality, you see something like yourself so engaged in it, and it's a generational issue. Uh, but I, I really do believe that, you know, uh, this generation, the next generation, that's really important to this country, that we continue to focus around excellence and quality and continue to improve however we can do it, you know, so that's great. So thank you I again agree. for the opportunity. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.